Israel's Prime Minister is in Washington for face-to-face -face talks with US President Barack Obama. Despite the traditionally warm relationship between the two countries, the leaders haven't met in person now for over a year. President Obama and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu say they are not giving up on peace in the Middle East. And apparently they're also not giving up on peace with each other. Correspondent Kevin Cork reports from the White House on the first face-to-face -face meeting between the two uneasy allies in more than a year. Even before their two-and-a-half-hour-long meeting, the president and prime minister acknowledged the elephant in the room, that the Iran nuclear deal drove a huge wedge between them, but wouldn't keep them from moving forward together. It's no secret that uh, the prime minister and I have had uh, a strong disagreement on this narrow issue, uh, but we don't have a disagreement uh, on the need uh, to making sure that Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. The controversial nuclear agreement, just one of several areas where the two leaders disagree. Among others, the growth of Jewish settlements and the lack of progress toward a two-state solution between Israelis and Palestinians, though Netanyahu said today he still supports the latter. But no issue has widened the gap like the Iran nuclear deal, a risky separation at a time when Iran and Russia are strengthening their partnership, including the recent sale of surface-to-air missiles to Tehran, all while ISIS spreads throughout Syria and Iraq. I think this is a, a tremendously important opportunity for us to work together to see how we can defend ourselves against uh, this aggression and this terror. Uh, how we can roll it back. It's a, a daunting task. That task is even tougher because of the threadbare relationship between the two men. It doesn't mean that they are the best of friends, uh, but it does mean that they are able to work effectively together uh, to advance the interests of the citizens of their countries. Further complicating the relationship, months old comments from the Prime Minister's choice for spokesman unearthed over the weekend. Ron Barat, who said the President's criticism of Bibi's speech on Capitol Hill during the Iran debate was an example of, quote, modern anti-Semitism in liberal Western states, and said Secretary of State John Kerry's, quote, mental age doesn't exceed that of a 12-year-old. Comments that drew a strong rebuke no from excuse. Vice President Biden. There should be no tolerance for any member or employee of an Israeli administration referring to the President of the United States in derogatory terms, period, 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 period. But the Israelis are also said to be seeking a 10-year, $50 billion military aid package from the Obama administration to better defend themselves, which would certainly seem appropriate given that a U.S. naval commander in the region said over the weekend that the Iranians have done very little to change their behavior since the signing of the Iran nuclear agreement back in July. Russia state technology corporation Rostec said on Monday that it will go ahead with a contract to supply Iran with advanced air defense missile systems. During the ongoing Dubai Air Show, Rostec head Sergei Chemazov confirmed the contract was back in force. Moscow and Tehran signed an 800 million US dollar contract for five S-300 systems in 2007. Russia halted the deal three years later because of UN sanctions. Iran, in response, filed a 4 billion US dollar lawsuit against Russia to an international arbitration court in Geneva. Earlier in April, Russian President Vladimir Putin lifted the suspension following a nuclear deal reached between Iran and the six world powers. Russia expects Iran to scrap its lawsuit against Russia once the first part of the contract is fulfilled, according to Chemzov. The modernized S-300 is developed to intercept ballistic missiles. It's currently regarded as one of the most potent air defense systems in the world.
International Conference on Supporting Palestine was held in the Lebanese capital Beirut, hosting a number of religious scholars who stood together to express solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Hezbollah Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah gave a televised speech during the conference in which he criticized the Arab world for their inaction towards Palestine. The new Palestinian Intifada surprised and frightened the Zionist entity. The Islamic community's approach towards the Palestinian cause is futile, and the Arab world has not responded to the Israeli attacks. A number of Arab countries have provided the terrorists in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya with weaponry, but they have not supported the Palestinians. We call on all the Muslims and Arabs to support the Palestinian Intifada in order to protect at least their religious sanctities. The conference was titled Towards El Quds Together for Palestine. Scholars from all around the world attended the conference as they spoke of a free Palestine. The conference sends a message to Israel that Palestine is still alive in our hearts. We scholars came together for the sake of Palestine and Al Quds. We stand with this Intifada as we stood with the first and second ones. I'm from Yemen and I came regardless of the aggression taking place in my country by our neighbors just in order to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Scholars have gathered to once again support the Palestinians and their fight against the Israeli occupation. The conference was aimed at sending the message that together with unity and patience, Al-Quds will be free. There's been another stabbing attempt in the West Bank on Monday as two Palestinians tried to attack a security guard at a checkpoint. One attack was shot and another escaped. On Sunday, the Israeli authorities released a video showing a Palestinian woman stabbing a security guard. He was injured in the attack. The same day, four Israelis needed treatment in the West Bank when a Palestinian rammed his car into a bus stop. The attacker was shot dead by Israeli forces. Well, amid the latest wave of violence between Israel and Palestine, Israelis are increasingly taking safety into their own hands. Shooting classes are becoming ever more popular, as RT's Paula Slea reports. Taking up a gun is fast becoming a means of survival. In a country where both Jews and Arabs are feeling more and more unsafe, the Israeli government has no quick fixes against what it's calling lone wolf attacks. It's introduced new rules that make it easier for security forces to open fire and also a minimum four-year jail sentence for Palestinian agitators. But what this doesn't address is the anger and frustration that's foiling the situation in the first place. Ironically, it's in a place like this, where bullets are flying, that many citizens now feel most secure. Hot, 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 hot. Numbers are up and people are coming to learn to shoot. I think there's a lot of pressure and stress on the population right now. These attacks are very personal um, and up close. But a weapon is a double-edged sword and experts warn many die from a bullet from their own gun. But still, the Israeli government is struggling to contain the violence and is urging citizens with licenses to carry their guns at all times. But as Shadi is quick to point out, for some Israelis, it's easier than for others. For an Israeli settler, his chances of getting a gun license are a thousand times higher than someone like me, who lives in a Druze village in the north, even though both of us served in the Israeli army. Shadi is a competitive shooter and is proud to show us the certificate licensing him to own a gun. But after having one for five years, the police recently confiscated it pending further investigation. By contrast, Nir Degani wears his like a badge of honour. For 16 years he worked as a police officer and after leaving the service was granted permission to keep his weapon. Since then, it's mostly been under lock and key at home, but now it goes with him everywhere. Because the last uh, situation, I uh, decided to take him with me. Even it's not, if even if it's not so uh, uh, convenient, if terror attack will be against other person that is near me, I have my two three second to arm the, the gun and the, uh, and release the safe and the, to act good as a good civilian as a good. Uh, uh, a good civilian and, and to help to, to avoid the, a, a, a more casualties in a terror attack. As the violence further exacerbates tensions between Jews and Arabs, there is one thing both agree on. To feel safe, 
they'll need to take matters into their own hands. اسم المحل هتلر وانا بحبه يعني من كتر ما هو كان اكثر واحد معادي لليهود لانه ظلمونا ويعني اخذوا حقنا كل حقنا اخذوه في البلد يعني ما خلوناش شيء يعني احنا الحين بس نروح نموت احسن احنا عايشين من قله الموت وعجبني كمان يعني اللبس هو احلى حاجه في اللبس والاسم يعني تبعه روعه Palestinian resistance continues in the occupied territories, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement has declared that it will support the cause by extending anti-Israeli boycotts. This has caused concern among the Israelis as the BDS has affected the Israeli economy before, causing millions of dollars of losses over the course of the previous year only. The movement is now saying that it has plans to continue its work in the West Bank. The boycott, divestment and sanctions movement believes that the current wave of protests is against the apartheid regime, racism and the military occupation. Palestinians have a right to use the methods they believe are appropriate and the BDS movement is part of this resistance and a struggle. Therefore, the BDS is working on a series of projects to escalate the boycott in the Palestinian territories as well. Some Israeli companies have attacked the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement by saying that they employ Arab workers and have published a list of Arab workers in Israeli companies. This is one of Israel's attempts to make the international community withdraw from the BDS movement. They seek to keep themselves free from charges against them for breaking international law as they are manufacturing products in illegal settlements. They have already created a ministry to combat the boycott. The Israeli Finance Ministry announced in a six-page report that the Israeli economy could lose up to 10.5 billion American dollars a year. The report says a full international boycott can seriously harm the Israeli economy. The boycott, divestment and sanctions movement's actions have affected Israel's economy in the past. And their current declaration is supporting the ongoing Palestinian protests. It was the second time in three days that Pope Francis had stumbled in public. Here it was during a service at the Basilica of St. John Lateran. But on Saturday the pontiff tripped on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica and had to be helped to his feet. The stumbles follow an Italian newspaper report last month claiming the Pope is afflicted with a benign brain tumour. The Vatican was quick to dismiss the story although it is widely known that Pope Francis lost part of one lung as a young man and suffers from leg pain due to sciatica. Francis has said he expects his papacy to be short. He closes every weekly Angelus address with an exhortation to the world's Catholics to pray for him. We saw a bright light in the sky. Initially it looked like either some sort of 
shooting star or like maybe an airplane with the bright light shining through the back and then it disappeared behind a building and when it came back out the other side um, it just looked like a regular airplane and then out of nowhere it just blew up into an enormous bright light. Honey, what is that light? And I said, oh, it might be a plane, maybe behind some fog or something like that. And we were coming up the hill and I was going, there's no more fog, so I don't know what the heck that was. It almost appeared to be moving like a plane, but as it moved, the green got brighter and expanded out in a trail behind. This massive shelf cloud moved over the ocean towards Sydney's Bondi Beach. Witnesses says it looked like a huge wave, as you can see they're prepared to engulf the area. Some were awestruck spectators ended up running from the what it called the wave in the sky. The shelf cloud swelled throughout, dumping heavy rain on the city. Spectacular photo and images right there. Storm slamming the south overnight. Tornadoes reported in Oklahoma and Texas where downpours and powerful winds have left a trail of destruction. ABC's Ryan Owens reports from Dallas. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning to you, George. We're in the parking lot of a bank building here north of Fort Worth. Let me get out of the way and you can absolutely see what happened here. That is some sheet metal that came off the roof of this building, blew right off onto cars in the parking lot below. The roof of the building just blew off. A reported tornado touches down right on top of this bank building north of Fort Worth, Texas. I'm gonna call 911 right now. The winds rip down pieces of the roof, tossing them onto cars below. Flying sheets of metal raining down just an hour before the end of the workday. All of a sudden we started hearing a swirling sound. It was very terrifying. Somehow no one is hurt, but plenty of cars are damaged. Across North Texas, a line of torrential blinding rain. This funnel cloud spotted earlier in the day. And all of a sudden, trees started cracking. The same storm illuminating the sky, hail leaving holes in cars. In Oklahoma, flying debris make for a driving adventure. This semi losing control and jackknifing, utility poles getting knocked to the ground. In Kansas, winds and rain practically halting traffic. And in Arkansas, transformers igniting after power lines were tossed to the ground. In the meantime, we turn to the state of emergency declared in parts of Mississippi today. Look at this, the earth giving way, a massive cave-in is what they're calling it, swallowing cars outside an IHOP restaurant while families inside watched in disbelief. And tonight, the mystery as investigators search for clues to what caused it. ABC's Lindsay Janice now. It almost doesn't look real. Tonight, investigators trying to figure out what created this gaping hole, roughly 30 feet deep and the length of a football field in this IHOP parking lot. Witnesses say it was a typical Saturday night in Meridian, Mississippi. The pancake house packed when suddenly the ground outside opening up, swallowing more than a dozen parked cars. Everyone in IHOP went into a panic. Incredibly, no one was inside or near their cars at the time. Tonight, officials saying it could be days before the vehicles are pulled out. And the mayor declaring that state of emergency as engineers try to solve the mystery of what caused the ground next to this brand new restaurant to bust open. New clues this morning point to ISIS involvement in the down Russian plane in Egypt. United States intelligence sources tell CBS News that the U.S. intercepted chatter from ISIS members after the attack, claiming that they had an insider at the Sharm El Sheikh airport. Russia has now asked that FBI to send in agents to the crash scene. The crash killed 224 people. Alan Pizzi is at the Sharm El Sheikh airport, where security today will face new scrutiny. Alan, good morning. Good morning. Well, the first of three teams of Russian inspectors is due today to begin examining security at the airport. They'll almost certainly be looking not only at whether it's improved, but how it may have been breached. With the search for wreckage and bodies almost completed, Russian emergency workers held a memorial service at the crash site, laying roses on one of the plane's wings. 
A full analysis of the evidence they found will take time, and Russian investigators have asked the FBI for assistance. 14-year-old victim Elisa Vitaliva was buried over the weekend, mourned by her grandparents, among many others. She was traveling with her mother, Irina. Her body has not yet been identified. Identifying the culprits may be easier. This ISIS video lauds its affiliate in the Sinai for bringing down the plane, a claim that intelligence services are now all but 100% sure is true. An ISIS statement said the operation was retaliation for Russian airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. Russia has begun a monumental airlift to bring 79,000 of its citizens out of Egypt. But President Vladimir Putin won't let it go at that if ISIS is guilty, in the view of CBS News senior security contributor and former CIA deputy director Michael Morell. I think Putin's reaction is going to be to go after ISIS in a very big way to show them the costs of doing this to his country. Just hours after reports an ISIS bomb may have brought down the Russian jetliner, Russian jets took off from a Syrian airbase, pounding ISIS' self-proclaimed capital of Raqqa with punishing airstrikes. A sign, perhaps, Russian leader Vladimir Putin is ready to devote more attention to the terrorist group. Since the plane broke apart mid-air nearly a week ago, President Putin has dismissed claims of terrorism. A reluctance, Kremlin watchers believe, to admit his people are paying the price for his strategy in Syria. But tonight, CNN has learned Putin quickly suspended all flights between Russia and Egypt after the U.S. and U.K. shared their intelligence about the doomed flight with Russia. Putin's actions are the surest sign yet he believes ISIS could be to blame. You know, while we can't rule anything in or out, we have to consider the uh, possibility that of potential terrorist involvement. Investigators now want to know if it was an inside job studying new surveillance video at the airport, looking for a suspect with access to the ramp to the plane, raising new questions about airport workers with possible ties to ISIS here in this country. And you're about to see the difference in security for all of us as we board planes and what airport workers go through. Here's ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, tonight. Investigators tonight are focused on whether what happened here was an inside job. An aviation security official tells ABC News that a surveillance video at the Sharm El Sheikh airport is being scrutinized for someone with access to the ramp who may have placed a suspect object in the plane's hold. ISIS may have concluded it's easier to defeat airport security by going around it. And now those same concerns of an inside job are being raised at U.S. airports. Homeland Security does not currently require 100% physical screening of airport workers. Some simply scan their badge and enter a code. For pilots and crew, as ABC station KGO found, their luggage goes uninspected to the dismay of some security analysts. Anyone who has access to the secure area or to the flight line uh, needs to be physically screened to ensure that they aren't bringing dangerous items or illegal items uh, onto an airplane. Aviation security officials tell ABC News today that dozens of current U.S. airport employees are under scrutiny now because of possible ties to or sympathies with extremist groups. They're getting through our screening process and getting into secure areas of the airport and being awarded credentials. I think we had 73 in instances of that. In fact, one of the Americans who went to Syria to join ISIS and was killed there, Abdul Rahman Mohammed, had previously worked for Delta Airlines as a cleaner at the Minneapolis airport. The TSA says it has already taken a number of steps to correct any security shortcomings that could lead to an inside job. We're learning of a security situation at Miami International Airport that shut down parts of the airport and also led to this. Everybody out. Everybody out. From the front. From the front. Everybody out. From the front. Front. Let's go. Quickly. Quickly. Heavily armed police boarded at least one plane. Other people at the airport reported being locked in restaurants. The FBI is apparently in charge of the scene. Chris Van Cleve is on the phone now. Chris, what are you learning? Well, Contessa, we know that this started as some kind of a security issue, and it sounds like it started around a security checkpoint in the SkyTrain in Terminal D at Miami International Airport. That's the American Airlines terminal. It is a gigantic terminal, uh, and a lot of traffic goes in and out of there. We know that nine flights diverted, about 50 at least, were delayed because of this lockdown situation. 
Um, the video you just showed, you know, sort of speaks for itself. It is certainly unusual when you see a plane cleared by tactical officers in, uh, in you know, that sort of assault-type gear, uh, the passengers with their hands over their heads uh, and being led off the plane. That's certainly unusual. Now, the way this was described by the airport sort of evolved over time, and they're, they're not giving us a ton of information. But initially it was described as a security incident around a checkpoint and the SkyTrain, and the SkyTrain um, operates inside Terminal uh, D there. Uh, from there, they also mentioned a, a suspicious package, uh, which then they sort of the lockdown expanded and took over much of Terminal D by the sounds of it. And that's when you started to see pictures from people who were literally locked inside restaurants. They brought the gates down uh, around people. So that, that certainly tells you that there was some concern, uh, although throughout the airport was, was putting out updates that the, the terminal was secure, the passengers were safe. So you're looking at what sounds like some kind of a security breach at Miami International Airport that now has been resolved, and the airport is beginning to return to normal operations after a, several very tense hours. Americans were shot to death this morning in Jordan. Another American was wounded. They were shot at a police training facility near the capital, Amman. Elizabeth Palmer is in London with the latest on this unfolding story. Elizabeth, good morning. Good morning. Several sources confirm that a Jordanian police captain shot and killed two Americans and one South African at a police training center in Muwaka, which is a town about 50 miles from the Jordanian capital, Amman. At least one other American and four Jordanians were wounded in the facility's cafeteria. The shooting apparently happened while the men were having lunch. The Americans, who were civilian contractors, are reported to have been trainers at the facility. A Jordanian government spokesman said the shooter, a described as a senior member of the training team, was subsequently killed. And we've just heard U.S. officials say the attacker was a disgruntled employee who had recently been fired. Jordan is one of America's closest allies in the Middle East. Currently, there are just over 2,000 U.S. military personnel as well stationed in Jordan. Quite separately, the U.S. was helping to staff a police training academy to help upgrade the skills of police from around the region, including Iraqi and Palestinian officers. Today's shooting is the first time any member of a local force has turned on Americans. The European Union can break apart. That can happen incredibly fast when isolation instead of solidarity, both inwards and outwards, becomes the rule. If we do not deliver some immediate and concrete actions on the ground in the next few days and weeks, I do believe that the European Union and the Europe as a whole will start to falling apart. Well, given that no common EU solution has so far been agreed to solve the refugee crisis, some member states are taking things into their own hands. Tightening border controls and introducing checks between countries of the Schengen Free Movement Treaty is now commonplace. The Prime Minister of Malta has announced, too, the closure of a number of roads and a limit on sea traffic ahead of the Valletta Summit on Migration, citing security reasons. France is imposing border controls for one month during UN climate talks. However, Paris claims the measures have nothing to do with the refugee crisis. Uh, Germany and Austria also tighten security and border checks until November to halt the refugee influx. Um, firstly, what do you make of these comments by Luxembourg's foreign minister? I mean, is he exaggerating when he says the EU might dissolve in only a matter of months? I mean, it's a big claim and um, time is running out of it is correct, isn't it? No, he's not. I mean, I think, you know, what he's saying is hardly surprising. In fact, he might be going far enough. As we saw at the dissolution of the Soviet Union, another union of, of many states in the, in the late part of the 80s and 90s, when these things tend to break up, it, it happens very quickly. And it's often comes from something that you don't suspect. Um, I think the, the refugee crisis um, has just thrown, you know, more petrol on, on a fire that's been burning in Europe for the last couple of years. There's a massive detachment between the elite who 
run the continent and the citizens of the continent. And, you know, at a time when there are homeless crises in some countries, like here in Ireland, when there are severe unemployment problems and severe economic problems in other states, to be admitting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, no matter how deserving they are, and most of them are very deserving, it's not going to go down very well. And, of course, it's going to fracture the union. And we see that already in, in southeastern Europe, in the Balkans, and we see it now spreading into Germany. And that's the big, big worry, because just as the Soviet Union began to break up when the biggest constituent country, Russia, began to tire of the idea, that's what could happen to the EU if the Germans end up turning against the very idea of, of further union. Um, it's a problem there that can't be ignored, so what's the solution? Well, I mean, you know, the, the basic thing we can, I don't want to go too far into it now, but we can argue that given the fact that all, most of the European Union countries are members of NATO, they should have realized when they supported intervention in Libya and Syria, not all of them supported the Iraq intervention, that's fair enough, but they should have realized that there was the potential for blowback here, that if people became dislocated, they might try to go towards Europe. That is what has happened. And now we have a situation where, can I just give an example here in Ireland, where we have actually got a homeless crisis at the moment in a country that's supposed to be one of the top 10 richest countries in the EU, if not the world. And, you know, I can only imagine in, in poorer EU countries, how are they going to deal with thousands, if not hundreds and tens of thousands of people arriving at the same time. We see Sweden creaking at the moment. We see Hungary wanting nothing to do with it. We see that, you know, going up into Slovakia, into Austria. And now, as I said a, a minute ago, it has come to Germany itself. And, you know, if the Germans become disenfranchised from the European project, really, God help Europe. Sure, but uh, closing the border is just going to displace the problem, isn't it? I mean, if all countries do this, what problem has been solved? It will only make it worse, won't it? You're just pushing it back. I mean, what you're doing is, I mean, if you close the borders from Germany down to Austria, down to Slovenia and into Croatia, all you're doing is pushing everybody into Serbia, for example, and just creating a massive logjam there. I mean, that's no solution either. But as I said, um, we're just seeing a, a massive, you know, disconnect between the people who govern Europe and the people they govern, uh, the citizens of Europe. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's coming home to roost now. And just very interestingly, if we think back to one year ago or two years ago before this refugee uh, stroke migrant crisis started. There was already, you know, um, growing uh, discontent in Sweden, in the United Kingdom, as evidenced through the success of UKIP. In France, we see through Front National against, you know, migration to Europe and to those individual countries of people from other countries. Now we suddenly have the migration intensified dramatically. And of course, I mean, that's going to lead to further tensions. <laughs> I think it's very important to have this sort of gathering of people with like-minded ideas and I hope that in the future this will become a more common thing because I think that groups like this are the only ones who are standing up for the, for the common people and the people representing us in the government at the moment are not representing us. We are as a collective to speak out for the unspoken people against the corruption, the lack of privacy, the cuts to the poorer people of the country and the world as well.
，仲有就係英國文化協會嘅代表 ，Woman Mr. Woman。啊，呢期都係天橋文化咯，我哋。